So now that we've gone over important contextual information relating to Shall Earth No More Inspire Thee by Emily Bronte, let's now do a line by line analysis of this entire poem. So let's go over a line by line analysis of Emily Bronte's Shall Earth No More Inspire Thee. And this is obviously a poem that appears in AQA's Worlds and Lives collection. Now, before I dive into the line-by-line -line analysis of each stanza, remember that this poem as a whole is comprised of seven stanzas. Now, what I'm going to do is begin by reading the first three stanzas, which you can see here, then talking about and analysing the title as well as these stanzas before I then read the subsequent four stanzas and then analyse them line by line. So, let's begin by reading through the poem, the first three stanzas. Shall earth no more inspire thee? Shall earth no more inspire thee, thou lonely dreamer now? Since passion may not fire thee, shall nature cease to bow? Thy mind is ever moving in regions dark to thee. Recall its useless roving. Come back and dwell with me. I know my mountain breezes and chant and soothe thee still. I know my sunshine pleases, despite thy wayward will. So let's have a look at these first three stanzas, starting off from the title itself, Shall Earth No More Inspire Thee. Now, when you're thinking about the title, remember that this poem is quite melancholic, it's quite sad, and the speaker begs the listener to essentially find comfort in nature during a dark period in their life. Now, the structure, as I mentioned, is it's seven stanzas, and more specifically, they are laid out in quatrains with an A. B, A, B, regular rhyme scheme. And remember that contextually at the time that this poem was published, which was 1846, Britain was experiencing a huge industrial revolution, which made a lot of people who moved from the countryside to the cities in search of work, in the factories and so on, that led to them becoming more distant from nature. Now, the poem's title is repeated in the first line, Shall earth no more inspire thee and this repetition illustrates the speakers worried because the listener is sad they used to be a dreamer but now they're disillusioned okay this is the person that they're referring to and they don't find nature inspiring this is the person who they're talking to when they address them as the in other words you then the speaker asks this rhetorical question, okay, so shall earth no more inspire thee, thou lonely dreamer now? And this rhetorical question illustrates that the speaker believes that this person seems quite lonely and lost. Then when they continue to say that since passion may not fire thee, what they are saying is that the listener no longer feels passion for anything, they're quite depressed. There's nothing to fire them into action. And of course, they end this rhetorical question using personification. And the speaker here wonders if the listen's listener has stopped caring about nature. And even the verb bow shows how sad nature feels because of this indifference, this lack of care. Now, in the second stanza, the speaker says, Thy mind is ever moving. And what this um, illustrates is the speaker wants to know what's going on in this listener's mind as they must be thinking something. And they show this through using enjambment and alliteration. Okay, so this is structure, enjambment, and alliteration. Then, when they say in regions dark to thee, this metaphor illustrates the speaker assuming the listener's mind is going to the darkest corners, right? They're so sad, they're really downcast, and they're desperate. The speaker is desperate to drag them out of these dark corners in their mind. And when they refer to useless roving, here the listener, or rather the speaker is telling the listener that they're just wasting precious mental energy, letting the mind rove, wander about on these really sad, depressive thoughts. And the speaker speaks in this imperative sentence because they want this person to leave this terrible place in their mind and come back to where they are, which is the present moment. Now, in the third stanza, the speaker refers to my mountain breezes. And the personal pronoun my is interesting because it makes us wonder for the first time if the speaker is nature addressing the listener, right? They're saying their mountain is superior and amazing. Of course, again, indicating that, you know, nature is really powerful and it can maybe lift this person out of the depression. Also, the repetitive reference to these, this pr pronoun, this personal pronoun, my, again makes us wonder if the speaker is nature telling the listener, come back to me. Of course, this reference to enchant and soothe thee still, the personification sibilance here conveys that the speaker's confident tone. They are certain that nature can heal this listener and make them feel as if they're under this beautiful spell. Also, the reference to wayward will shows, uh, well, firstly, remember that it means someone who's unpredictable and difficult, difficult to control. And the alliteration here illustrates that the speaker is saying that nature will hold this stubborn spirit within them. 
So let's read through the final four stanzas of this poem. When day with evening bending sinks from summer sky, I've seen thy spirit bending in fond idolatry. I've watched thee every hour. I know my mighty sway. I know my magic power to drive thy griefs away. Few hearts to mortal given on earth so wildly pine, yet none would ask a heaven more like this earth than thine. Then let thy winds caress thee, thy comrade. Let me be, since naught beside can bless thee, return and dwell with me. So let's look at the fourth stanza. Now, the speaker refers to when day with evening, and this reference to day and evening, this is really powerful, pathetic fallacy. The speaker here is describing the beauty of the sky as it changes from daytime to evening. Also, the reference is sink, summer, and sky. This is smooth sibilance, and this conveys a smooth transition from light to darkness. And the reference here to thy spirit bending, the uh, author, or rather the poet, uses on John Mont to illustrate how the speaker notices the listen spirit is moved by what they see in the sky. And of course, this reference to fond idolatry, we can see here that the speaker notices how happy the listener, or how happily the listener worships mother nature, even if they may want to hide it. And the following stanza, this reference to every hour is hyperbole. The speaker has watched this listener quite closely and the repetitive, I know my, I know my, this makes us wonder again if the speaker is nature basically observing this uh, listener and basically reinforcing how amazing it is to come back to it, okay? So the speaker is really bold and certain that nature has the cure. And we're wondering, I guess at this stage, we can wonder and maybe guess that nature might be the speaker and is telling the, the listener, hey, you're feeling sad, come back to me. I'm gonna cure you of this sadness. Also, the reference to magic power is really powerful because it's illustrating that nature can cast us all into this wonderful spell and it can restore our sense of wonder and enchantment. And the reference here to drive thy griefs away. Here we can see the speaker is absolutely certain nature can help lift the listener's melancholy, the darkness, the morose attitude, as well as the loneliness. Now, in the second to last stanza, this first opening sentence uses on John Mon. And here we can see that the speaker is flattering the listener by saying that few people have a heart as strong and as determined as them. And the reference to none would ask a heaven more like this earth than thine. Here the speaker is just telling the listener that nature on earth is heavenly. Nobody can ever ask God for anything more heavenly than the natural world that surrounds them. So it's a blessing. And they're basically telling the listener, look, you need to recognize this blessing that's all around you. Turn to it, especially in this dark moment. Now, in the final stanza, the speaker says, my winds caress thee. And the personification here is used to illustrate the speaker is begging the listener to reconnect with nature so that it can heal and restore them back to the once carefree, wandering mind and spirit. Now, the reference to thy comrade here, we can see that the speaker again is nature, right? It's asking its listener who are human beings by extension to see nature as a friend, right? It's basically perhaps the broader message of this poem is it's speaking directly to us as humans, right? Us who maybe get wrapped up in our daily lives in cities, maybe um, people who are reading this during the Industrial Revolution, they're getting really wrapped up in the cares and the worries of living in the city. And this is just a reminder, perhaps, to turn back to nature which can be really rejuvenating and powerful. Also, the reference to beside and bless. These are literative plosives. And what the speaker is trying to say here is nothing else aside from the natural world can bless them. And the final sentence in this stanza uses imperative sentence, a command sentence. And here the speaker basically wants this, the, they want the listener to be close and at one with nature. So that's really it when it comes to analysing in lots of detail this poem by Emily Bronte. Now, if you found it useful, of course, make sure you subscribe. And of course, I hope you found this video useful, especially in terms of understanding this poem in lots of depth in the AQA Worlds and Lives anthology. Thank you so much for listening.